conserve it now. That's the Forest Service. And so the Roosevelt's point of view, yeah, he's worried about forests, but his big thing is he wanted to kill big game animals. He wanted to kill trophy animals. Okay, it was alive he wanted to kill. But he was worried that if the forests are gone, those animals that he wants to kill tomorrow will be gone. And what his point of view was and how Merck got him, look at the vice. And Roosevelt, I really would have loved to see those, just the whole countryside covered with bison. Yes, so we could kill them, but that was his point. And I'll tell you, remind me on Tuesday, I'll tell you the teddy bear story, but that's my Roosevelt's point of view. Same thing with water. His idea of water was, here we, in the American West, which he had been through, there's no rain. And any water that does go gets in rivers and goes right on the ocean. We got to conserve that water. That was his idea of conservation. And the bill he would pass and push for would be the Reclamations Act. And that would be for irrigation of the arid west. And what they called that was reclaim it to agriculture. Now, that really doesn't make a lot of sense, but it doesn't matter. Because it, when was it agriculture in this context? But irrigation. And so what that meant was, Dams. This would be the biggest dam program in American history. Ah, so much fun. So they would begin building dams relatively modestly, but when the New Deal hit, they built dams everywhere. And by the 1970s, every place that could have a dam in the continent of the United States, almost every place, has a dam. They wanted to dam Yosemite and just barely say that. And that's kind of a big deal for Montana because if they would have dammed Yosemite, they would have dammed Yellowstone. But that didn't happen. But you can't build a dam anyway. You just can't say, I'm going to build a dam. It's got to be anchored on granite. And so every place has a dam pretty much has a dam in the continent of the United States. You know, there's a few places like in Alaska that they're even talking about dams. But there's just almost no place. Yeah. This is true. So, not a major dam, like an irrigation going so. Yeah, there's there's ir now irrigation damming, and almost all those have to go through the Bureau of Reclamation, but it can't be a full dam. But yeah, they do that for irrigation. And those are usually temporary is not the right word, but it's it's a dam that can be removed quite easily. But they're still there. And also hydroelectricity. I mean, this is going this is actually a real crisis. Because where is Bureau Reclamation going to do most of its dam? I mean, even though, yep, on the Missouri, all partially or fully Bureau Reclam Reclam Reclamation, all those dams on the Missouri right near Helena. Bureau Reclamation. Lake Helena, Bureau Reclamation. So it's uh, that's the big dam to basically it's almost run. And, Nobody wants to talk about this. <laughs> okay, so also the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act would allow the president through executive order to basically designate an area that will be not quite a national park, but limit the use. So it becomes almost like a national park. So the president by executive order, and almost every president, some more than others, right, right before they leave office, will designate a bunch of areas. Some will be personal projects, some will be lobby, you know, that kind of thing. Roosevelt wanted to do like uh, the Escalades uh, Monument and, and Monument and Monument Valley in Utah. He was really desperate to say. But the first big one of these monuments would be number one, Devil's Tower in, in Wyoming. Roosevelt wanted to say, if you ever give it a chance, Devil's Tower is really cool. And these are all the monuments. This one's like on the Bighorn, Bitterroot near um, Big Old Battlefield. <laughs> this one is right below Glacier. Missouri Breaks. I couldn't remember third period. That's a Missouri Breaks Martin. And so my guess is like Biden will do a bunch right before he leaves office. You know, like literally right before the inauguration of the other president. So with that, 
Roosevelt would also get the reputation of a trust buster. Not because he broke up a lot of trust. Taft actually broke up more trust, and Taft was a little more laissez faire conservative. But he's the first one to use the Sherman Antitrust Act. And he and it stopped the merger of three railroads called the Northern Security Trust. He stopped that merger because, well, actually, his Justice Department did, saying it would be an illegal restraint in trade, a monopoly. So they broke up this trade. I'll give you an idea of what, how powerful this would have been. It was the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific. They would have dominated this project. Also, the Berlin Department. They would eventually form in the early 70s, and that's the Berlin to Northern Santa Fe. So it happened, and now it is a monopoly. But here's Roosevelt, you're beating the big stick, but now uh, it's just with no molly coddling. Roosevelt's going to be tough, but it's kind of funny. It's just all the trust, and also everything else, he's just beating people. So also shows there's a little pell mell here. I kind of like that one. His Justice Department also begin breaking up Standard Oil. That massive oil monopoly. And it was finally broken up when Taft was president. But it was started under Roosevelt. So Roosevelt's going to be called the trust buster. Not because he broke up a lot of trust, but because of the Sherman Antitrust. And we're going to jump right to, no, I'll tell you the boxing story. Let's get to, I promise I'll tell you on Tuesday. Would that be okay? You wait a day. Four days. So, 1907, a panic hit. Another one, we talked about the boom bust cycle. It was a, a bubble in gold. There was a run on the gold market, railroad bubble, a bank panic. And it showed that there was no national bank. There was nothing to show people that their bank was secure and to inject money into banks before they collapsed and caused a panic. There was nothing in place. There needed to be something. Now, what kind of bank it would be, that's going to come in six years. Here's it, of the pen. After the U.S. government just gave J.P. Morgan's bank billions of dollars then to give to banks. That's a pretty happy system. But TR is going to be blank. TR would talk about running again, even though conservative, uh, hard, they call them old guard Republicans, were opposed to him. But this destroyed his chances. Couldn't run out of panic. Presidents are always you know, given too much blame or too much credit for things that happen in the country. <laughs> and sometimes the real issues they do solve or, or, or cause are ignored. So we're going to jump right to the election of 1908. Roosevelt can't run. The panic turned out to lead to a depression not as bad. And his handpicked successor, William Howard Taft, would run. Taft didn't want to be president. He wanted to be on the Supreme Court. But Roosevelt coerced him. Taft had some resentment. The Democrats, out P. Parker was a disaster. They went to William James. So they went back to the populace. That seemed old, even though the progressives and the square deal were populist ideas. So here's Brian, here's Taft. I should add, okay, I don't want to forget to set, tell you this. So Taft will serve one term. He would be nominated and serve on the Supreme Court in the 1920s. So a former president would go on the Supreme Court. Warren G. Hardin would have done I just find that, you know, it's kind of weird to think about the president being on there. Some people talked about appointing, like, uh, uh, former President Obama on the Supreme Court. And, you know, they seem like, oh, you know, because he's a constitutional scholar and that kind of thing. But yeah, he didn't want anything. He made it very clear. <laughs> I'm done after eight years. John Quincy Adams served in the House of Representatives. But most of the time, the, when the president's done, the president's done politically. That's just not good. If they're popular or not, they're, they're good. So when the election finally happened, Brian, once again, lost. Bryant's in blue, Taft's in red. Bryant got his home state, a few places. The election was crazy been in Montana, but Taft won. But almost immediately, 
there's going to be problems for Taft, and they're going to come from Roosevelt. Roosevelt, or from Roosevelt's side of the party. Roosevelt's going to go to Africa on a safari. He would write, Roosevelt was a prolific writer, wrote a huge multi-volume set about his basically killing every animal he could find in Africa. He was really worried that the big game animals in Africa would all be killed before we could. So he killed innumerable lions and rhinoceros and, and elephants, which uh, I'm not going to lie, my point of view, it makes me sad. But at the same time, um, you know, he did it and they would have been dead anyways. So moving on, then he went to Europe and he kind of a grand tour of Europe. I'm here and he was treated like a king. While he was gone, his prize conservation law aren't challenged. It's going to be called the Hinchio Ballinger Affair. Richard Ballinger was Taft's Secretary of the Interior. And he set aside a million acres of public land, set it aside for oil and timber interests, with the implication of a bribe down the road, basically at a high level position in either an oil or timber company. He was wrong. This is called the revolving door. You know, Regulators would do regulated in industry and then get a job in that very same industry. It's a big issue today. Well, this is kind of see, under the cover. But the head of the Forest Service was a protege of Mirror and a friend of Roosevelt named Gifford, Gil, Gifford Pinchot. And Pinchot told the press, he's head of Forest Service, and he told what the Interior Department did. So he let this out that they gave. Oil and timber, timber interests, all of this land. Taft was furious at whom? Pinchel. Now, Taft had nothing to do with the land. Pinchel did it as the department. Taft was mad that not only did was Ballinger his appointee, but it made Taft look bad. And so Taft backed Ballinger, and the sale went through. And TR heard about this in his grand tour of Europe and was furious at Taft, saying, You've destroyed my legacy. And remember, most of the square deal didn't pass. So this is the biggest part of his legacy to his point of view. Pepper and Apple is a big deal, but most people don't think about it. Series so Roosevelt and Taft, and it says U.S. conservation laws. And it's in Joe Ballinger right there. And so with that, Roosevelt 1910 said, I'm going to run again. One of the earliest announcements ever. He said, I'm throwing my hat in the ring. That's why he got a hat in the ring. So here's a boxing ring. And this is a temporary boxing ring. So prize fighters, the way to make extra money would travel the country. And they'd set up a temporary ring and it, like at a state fair. And they would take on any challenger, come fight the champ. You pay a hundred bucks, you get a fighting, but you get a thousand dollar prize. And so people will, there's always some guy, I'll fight him. And how did so the first one to fight? You know, they'd all throw their hat into the boxing ring, and the first one that landed got to fight the champ. Thus, hat in the ring. And for the most part, get the tar beat out of them by a professional boxer. But that's hat in the ring. Roosevelt was a boxer. So the election in 1912 would be one of the most exciting elections in American history. I'm not exaggerating. So these four will all run for president, all be legitimate candidates. We haven't had four since 19 or 1824. And remember, Uncle Sam, but also Lady Columbia, that's Miss Columbia, that's still you know, World War I, it all go Uncle Sam as the same. And so let's get to it. The Republicans are gonna nominate Taft. Conservatives got their revenge. They got their revenge for the square league. In fact, Roosevelt went to the convention in Philadelphia and was not even allowed in. He was not even allowed into the door. Think about it. The former and very popular Republican president was not allowed in. Uh, I, I think it's really funny. Roosevelt hired a bunch of, uh, or hired the P.T. Barnum Circus. They got a bunch of elephants to go back and forth in front of it and a bunch of drums from the elephants beating on drums. I just found that hilarious. But, Oh, and it shows here, like with a gun, a knife, Roosevelt and Taft now fighting. 
and all those resentments came out. And Taft realized now, if Roosevelt runs, if Roosevelt runs as a third party, Taft can't win. He said, I'm fine with that, as long as Roosevelt does it. And so Roosevelt joined the tiny little progressive party, became their candidate. Remember, third parties don't do well because third parties take away votes from the other parties. Remember, we're winner take all. That's why we have two parties. Stuck with it. Or I'm using stuck with it as could be good or bad, your point of view. But progressive party, no one voted for it. They got no votes at all. All of a sudden now Teddy Roosevelt, this one election, that party will be big. Roosevelt was asked, how would you feel, Mr. President, to jump back into the race? And he said, I feel it's fit just as a bull moose. Thus, the bull moose party. You can see lots of pictures of moose. And Roosevelt was known for his big grin, so I like that one. And I like with the Repo Republicans and Democrats, elephant donkey looking on. But now the Republicans are split. The Republicans are split, just like 1860 when the Democrats were split. And so all the Democrats have to do is not screw up, literally. Remember, third party, they'll take away. So the Democrats, they didn't vote for a populist. Oh, almost forgot. So Roosevelt program is gonna be called New Nationalism. Taking this idea of America, the United States will be stronger. And he meant everybody stronger. So it's basically a square deal. Everything from minimum wage, old age pension, you name it. It's a square deal. But he really emphasized social justice. We are only as strong as our weakest link. We have to help people who are underemployed, unemployed, better jobs, higher pay, raise the middle class. And so he was moving more left and using the terminology his cousin would use, more liberal. In fact, he had a lot of socialist ideas, including potential government takeover of railroads, utilities, and um, telephone telegraph. Take it all. They're too corrupt. And so he had gone pretty far, partially because he was furious at the Republicans. And, you know, Roosevelt had these ideas. Oh, and also supporting women's suffrage. Really, so that's a major part of it. So let's get to Wilson. The Democrats nominated Woodrow Wilson, the governor of New Jersey, but he was a Southerner. He had moved up in Virginia. The first Southerner that would be elected president is Zachary Taylor. And he's a progressive. So he's not a populist. So he could move away from, from Bryan and his program, everyone's got, you know, square deal, you gotta have something. Square deal, new nationalism, new freedom. And new freedom was very close to the square deal, a lot of the same things. And once again, emphasizing women's suffrage. I'm mentioning that because now by 1912, all the progressives are talking. Half gave it lip service. Roosevelt and Wilson said they're gonna fight for it. And the socialist candidate, Deb, said, well, of course we're for it. It's no coincidence that two years later, because of this push, Montana will allow women to vote. It was six years before the national government. I should have when Wilson became president, he locked in this suffrage. It's going to take women to do it. Oh, on that review list, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. Alice Paul I have on there, she will not be on the test. I'm going to include her in World War I. So let's get through this really quick. Regulations and monopolies. That is where they differ between Wilson and Roosevelt. DR looked at it and said, sure, I don't like monopolies, but they're not all mad. They literally called them good trust. And remember that term, do, 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 e economies of scale. Because of economies of scale, some companies are more efficient. They can produce things cheaper. We should encourage these efficiencies, but they should be heavily regulated like the pub, like, um. His idea was, best example was electrical utilities. Electricity, how many companies do we need to provide electricity to Helena? 
mean, could you imagine five power companies with five different sets of power lines going all over the place? That would be really inefficient. One utility heavily regulated. You could say, say the same thing with how many railroads could possibly go to Helen? Maybe two? So regular. That was his idea. But they're good trucks. We should encourage them. They're more efficient. And then there are bad trucks, and they should be broken up. And so here is using the teddy bear, and I'll tell you the teddy bear story later. He bagged the bad trust, and the good trust you notice there. And here's the rest of the companies, a little under control, then they know. But who will decide what's good and bad? PR. And so that puts a lot of centralized power in one person. And so I think you see, uh, if you agree with this idea, I think you see the problem. One president might agree, one president might say, we want all monopolies, one president might say, no monopolies. This puts a lot of power in that one person. Wilson, on the other hand, said, I don't care about efficiencies. All monopolies are bad. Straight to the Sherman Antitrust Act, more competition, go. And for a short time, there would be a real bit of antitrust. Then the 1920s would reverse that completely. And then the 1930s, that would change again. Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, they actually kind of tried to do both. Roosevelt tried to do both, eventually settling on some like utility should be regulated and then break out monopolies. That became possible. And that would be until about 1980, 79, 80, 81, the end of Jimmy Carter into Ronald Reagan through today. And then the socialists on the outside ran one of their most successful campaigns, Eugene Debs. And it was pretty close to the progressive new nationalist problem. I really close, really close. And so the issue about the socialists were really popular. They took away votes from Roosevelt. So you have this weird thing where the Republicans are split, Roosevelt split, Wilson set. Wilson's only going to get 42% of the vote, not much more than, than uh, Lincoln got back in 1860. I'll show you that. I'll talk about the Legos down the road, I promise. Tuesday. Oh, he did not ride a bull, a bull moose. If you look up Roosevelt, see pictures of this, it did not happen. You cannot ride a moose. Do not try to ride a moose. Wilson would win. We'll jump it right to Wilson's in green right here. Democrats are in green. Heck, Montana was razor thin. But because of the split, and Debs was pretty popular in Montana. Debs was really popular in Beauty Uh Wilson won. Wilson won. The Progressive Party did have one more little blip in 24, but they would, they're still a Progressive Party. But it is, I mean, literally, I think in the last presidential election, they got like 20,000 votes nationwide. There's a lot of third parties. So, last couple of things really quick. There'd be two amendments proposed before Wilson, but would take effect once he became president. The 16th and 17th Amendments. The 16th Amendment would allow for an increase. 17th, no more state legislatures voting for senators. They would be vote for, voted in a popular vote by the entire state. But um, two senators per state, that is actually enshrined in the Constitution, and it says in the United States Constitution that can't be amended. So that state, they could amend what the Senate does, but they can't amend how many senators. I should add, the Constitution was written pre pre capitalist and pre wage system, and so it doesn't say income tax in it because that would have made no sense to somebody in 1787. It was just starting to begin to be understood a little tiny bit. In Britain, but not the US. And so that was found to be unconstitutional. And so that's why they added it. And the first income tax would be part of a lowering of the tariff called the Underwood Tariff and a 4% tax on very large incomes. 
the income tax would go grow a lot in World War I because you gotta pay for the war. And so here is taking that first bill down to Washington as the first income tax. This was a major progressive reform. But you should remember, first introduced this with the populists. So the progressives took a lot of the populist ideas. Okay, a couple of laws in really quick. His other progressive agenda would be uh, just a few laws. You notice I say really quick about a lot, but I'm really quick about it. The Clayton Antitrust Act. The Clayton Antitrust Act would strengthen the Sherman Antitrust Act. It wasn't really a new law as more like an amendment to the old law. So today we still have, the Sherman Antitrust Act is still the law. The Clayton Antitrust Act just gave more enforcement powers, but it's still pretty weak. And we still have the weird antitrust in our law today that no one knows what antitrust means. But the big thing it did is it created a regulatory body appointed by the president, the Federal Trade Commission or the FTC, really important body. They look into monopolies, legal restraint of trade, and whether or not there could be mergers. They could up and down stop mergers, but they can't stop mergers that are seen to be monopolistic. Now, the FTC did nothing for 40 years. This is the first time in really since Nixon, but especially Lyndon Johnson. So we're talking 70s, 60s, that the FTC right now is kind of aggressively stopping mergers and monopolies and actually talking about breaking up companies. So we're kind of in the middle of a change. I don't know how far it's going to go, but this is kind of radical right now. Kind of going away or at least pushing back against monopoly power. But that all comes from here. Really important progressive agenda. Uh, so, for example, um, the FTC also would do things like, you know, like you get a phone and um, they're the ones who look into uh, like Apple, making sure you only buy Apple apps. The FTC is the one who looks at that as a legal restraint of trade. That's the thing. Also, they passed the Keating Owens Act and the first law to limit child labor, national law. There have been a couple state laws that were thrown out called Lochner versus New York. And the Supreme Court's going to throw this one out too. And this era, the very conservative laws, conservative laws I favor, Supreme Court, remember, just talking purely economics, they, it's called the Lochner era. And when it's stretched into the 1930s very much anti-progressive regulation. So they threw out child labor laws. They said it violated the children's right to sign a contract. I should add, there's a big movement in some states now to bring, to get rid of child labor laws. Right now, big movement. There might be Montana, but Montana, it's against the state constitution. But other states where they don't have that, yeah, big movement to bring that back, to get rid of child labor laws, to bring back kids working. Full time. I know kids work, but also Federal Reserve Act. Federal Reserve Act, 1913, we set up a national. And so <laughs> this is one of the most important reforms. And all banks would join this. It set up a Federal Reserve System of 12 banks, and they regulate banks. Any banks that enter this system must agree to government regulation, and therefore they can borrow money from the Federal Reserve Bank, borrow money from other banks, it tells people that this bank is safe. It regulates bank. And the Federal Reserve Board then controls this entire 12 bank operation. The board are appointed by the president, approved by Congress, but technically they're outside the bounds of the president. They're relatively independent. This is actually really controversial. And this cartoon is against the Federal Reserve saying, you're giving too much power to this Federal Reserve Bank. It's gonna be like an octopus. And the Federal Reserve Board shrinks and they control the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate is the bank, basically the rate that bank, the Federal Reserve loans money to banks, and that controls interest rates. So some of you might know that this month, or, uh, earlier this month, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates again to try to slow down inflation, even though inflation is definitely plateau. We'll see where it goes from there. But 
they raise interest rates. That's they raise the federal fund. And that will raise interest rates and therefore control the money supply. If you raise interest rates, it's harder to borrow money and therefore lowers the money supply. Really powerful body. And he segregated the federal government. Woodrow Wilson, the Southerner who believed in the lost cause, very social Darwinistic, would bring Jim Crow to the federal government. Here's Jim Crow in various national parks. You see? And so segregated, including a memorial that had just been completed during his administration. The Lincoln Memorial was open and Wilson had it segregated. The irony of that should just be like, it, it's, it's almost overwhelming, isn't it? If you go to the Lincoln Memorial today, every one of these things have, has a gift shop that you probably know. The gift shop at the Lincoln Memorial is in the basement of it. And that was the old, they called them, it was called a colored bathroom. It's now a gift shop. And we're going to stop right there. I have a little bit, but um, this, so right there. So most of these things in the bill will not be, you know, if you talk about Wilson, the only thing that might be a short ID we did today, I think about, you know, the different idea of regular, a uh, different idea of monopolies. You're going to talk about, you know, uh, Wilson, all monopolies are bad, Roosevelt, some are good, some are bad. Other than that, good. If you have any questions, text me brief paper, pencil, or pencil, or what do you have to write your short IDs and short answer questions in? Ah, you're getting so good. What color pen? Black. No. Blue or black pen. Blue or black pen, please. Start the bell. And then don't let me forget, I'll tell you the boxing story, I'll tell you the teddy bears, I'll tell you the food story, I'll tell you the chili story. I'll show you McNuggets. I'm waiting for a message from my wife. It did not come.